Welcome, you guys, to Art 116 in the afternoon. It's Friday afternoon. It's one of those horrible Fridays where it's raining and everybody's depressed and whatnot. And I have to blow a little color and um, happiness, you know, up your skirt. And I'm going to try to do that today uh, with a demonstration um, of subjective color. Um, last Wednesday, I started this mess. I started the presentation on subjective color and gave a couple of um, examples of artists from art history that do subjective color. And of course, as soon as I start talking, <clears throat> my voice wants to go away, which I don't understand that at all. <clears throat> I have this wonderful sheet that I printed up years ago um, for this project on subjective color. And I have yet to actually make a subjective color assignment in coursework. So as soon as I get off of here today, I'm going to make the assignment in coursework. I will upload this document, which has, you know, at least a page of, you know, instructions on how to do this, plus lots of examples in living color about some of the um, some of the artworks that we've already talked about in turning, including the Turning Road right here by Dorraine, and perhaps you know one of Matisse's um, uh, paintings from the uh, Fauvist period, and of course a couple of these nasty um, Warhol Marilyns to look and talk about a little bit. So this document will be uploaded to coursework for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do my share screen share and kind of bounce back and forth between screen share and you guys. And I'm going to do a demonstration too. So let's try this. Let's see what happens. Whoa, wait a minute. That's not where I wanted to be. Is that where I wanted to be? Sure. Why not? Um, one of the projects that I wanted to share with you guys <clears throat> was um, this Roy Lichtenstein painting that is also in many art history books over the last 40 years. Um, and you guys probably think that comic book art and um, uh, graphic novels and that kind of thing, you know, are a relatively new phenomenon. But Lichtenstein was one of the people uh, in the pop art movement who really was playing around with imagery from comics and comic books. And so this is a large, in fact, it's a diptych. It's two paintings um, that are uh, side by side to each other with a seam down the middle, <clears throat> where he was actually putting some of this comic book imagery together. So I thought I'd throw this one together as an image that you guys might want to actually try to repaint in subjective color. Now you can see that this is a little bit different because he's using a lot of the Bende dots that are kind of part of the graphic process for publishing, especially in the 1960s and 70s. And, but he's also using um, pure color in uh, some of these color shapes in the composition. So like um, in the explosion here of the exploding airplane that this fighter pilot has just shot down, you know, we see the explosion and it's kind of this you know, it's a very um, comic book oriented explosion where the fire and flames are defined by the black contour lines uh, and the contour lines contain each color and we've only got white, red and yellow in this explosion and they are, uh, they are very well confined by the contour lines that describe each shape and then <clears throat> the color also out here um, animating the letters wham, which happens to be the title of this painting by Lichtenstein. So I made this up as um, uh, a printout on uh, cardstock so that you guys could paint this or repaint this um, in uh, the color scheme of your choice for subjective color. What else have I got up here? Ah, yes, here's a little film still of M Margaret Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz from 1940. And of course, um, I was talking about Warhol the other day. And, you know, Warhol couldn't leave anything alone in pop culture, including Margaret Hamilton and The Wicked Witch. And so 
his uh, Wicked Witch of the West uh, goes something like this. Now, there's many different versions of this out there, but uh, this is the one that has the violet background. And of course, Margaret Hamilton's face as the Wicked Witch is in green, but we also have red in here for the lips and the interior of the mouth, which makes her again, kind of ghastly and a little bit monstrous and all of that. Um, like all of the other Warhol silk screens, um, this uh, takes a photograph and translates the photograph into at least one, um, one silk screen that has all of the material in it for textures and hair color and details of the eyes, nose, and mouth, uh, including the teeth and everything. And so that one is, of course, done in black. But then, you know, her costume is in black. But then this is some Warhol stuff that's late, from later in his career that seems a little bit more graphic to me. These contour lines that are kind of bonus contour lines, the red and this kind of white violet contour line that goes around the hat and everything else. And because it's just a little bit not quite um, in sync with the rest of the outline of the costume, it seems to help to make the costume vibrate a little bit more violently as she's laughing maniacally at you. And so these, these little contour lines that are kind of wiggling in the, in the edges around the costume are pretty darn important to sell the idea of the Wicked Witch. So it's, it's something to think about. He also kind of went back in here with some doodly contour lines to help create some of the hair texture that is kind of completely um, you know, obliterated by the black and the shadows underneath this hat. And so we've got her ears and hair texture kind of um, suggested by this very gestural line that's in here that's done in, in light green over here, but it looks like a, um, <clears throat> Uh, some kind of a, a fade, a mod, moderation, what do you call that? Um, anyway, it, it kind of goes from blue-violet and blue-violet with some white in it to a light green up here. Um, it's, it's had a, uh, oh, what is that called? Um, a gradient? It's, it's something in Photoshop that you can apply to something that, that moves it from one color into another color. I can't think of it right now, but of course you guys know it on the tip of your tongue. I got to keep going though. So, well, wait a minute. We got to go find something that's not quite that. Um, where is the, the witch? And that's that, and that's this, and that's this. Okay, so another Warhol image um, deals with the... Um, uh, <laughs> the birth of Venus, which that torso uh, was from the birth of Venus. This is Botticelli's birth of Venus. He's an, uh, from the Italian Renaissance, the early part of the Italian Renaissance, about the 1480s, 1470s, something like that. And the birth of Venus is a pretty famous thing in all the art history books. So Warhol had to play with it a little bit and do his own take on it. Uh, at, at least uh, he zoomed in on the portrait piece and uh, applied the four color silk screen concept to uh, the portrait in the in Botticelli's Birth of Venus. And so I thought I would make that one available to you guys also as a possible um, subjective color painting project. So you can do that. Now, where is my other screen share stuff? Because it's not up on my screen which is what's making me mad about all this. So I'm going to stop this share. And I just wanted to go to screen share one more time, if it'll let me. And here it is. Here's the one that I wanted to share with you guys. So moving some of us out of the way for this thing, um, onto just a piece of paper, I brought in um, Warhol's uh, zoom in portrait of of, of Venus. And then here's the Botticelli painting down here. Um, she's born in the sea and Botticelli's interpretation is that the gentle winds are blowing her into shore where uh, a forest nymph is waiting to greet her on shore with a cloak made out of flowers and to clothe her you know, in her naked loveliness. But what's interesting about the Venus is that when she's born, she is very um, 
innocent, extremely beautiful, very innocent. The wind is blowing through her hair because, of course, these guys are blowing from one side towards the other. And so we get all of this wonderful movement in the hair that is just absolutely wonderful. And so with the very long elongated neck going one direction and the head tilt going the other direction, we have, even in the portrait, the S curve of the contrapposto pose that was very uh, unique and wonderful uh, about um, Renaissance uh, figurative uh, art. And uh, we have that, that sense of movement implied in the composition too. So I'm gonna come back to you guys. I'm gonna hit my stop share button and come back to you and try to do a quick and dirty portrait of this gradient. Thank you, Nick, you are wonderful. Saving my life once again. Yes, a gradient was applied to those lines that were in Margaret Hamilton's, or I should say the Wicked Witch's hair. So anyway, let's try to do a project nine, shall we? <clears throat> this morning was just a little bit more ragged than this afternoon's composition. And so I tried to do a birth of Venus portrait. And I think I'll try it again for you guys in the afternoon. Oh, and I have to turn up the volume because every time this thing reboots, I can't hear you guys. I heard somebody try to say something. Now I've got the volume turned up to 100. So you guys can say it if you want to. So I, I took the liberty of printing out this so that I would have this somewhere on my desktop where I could work on it. And I've got myself another one of my printouts on cardstock that I'll be able to do with you guys. Did I do? I'm recording. All right, I am recording. Good. So I'm going to do this. So let's do this. I'm going to change camera angles to the um, overhead thing. And we're going to do this thing just like as if I knew what I was doing, which I may not. So put Venus here and this one here and put the uh, uh, palette here so that I can do something. And what color will Venus be? Well, this is light green, which is kind of interesting. The original one was peach. And I don't wanna do peach. They did red in the background. Ah, I wanted to do red in the background. I guess I'm gonna do violet. I'm gonna do a light violet in the background. Let's throw the background in there first while I'm trying to decide what I'm gonna do for her flesh tone. So I'm gonna do some white and drag some white and violet together to give me some kind of a um, higher key violet, a tint of violet that I can then throw into the background here. And I can just kind of mop this into the background to give us some something to start with here. And I don't even need to do a whole lot of blending because wouldn't it be nice if, if it actually had some paint strokes and streaks in it. I can even get rid of this because I don't need that anymore. That was kind of fun. So I will mop some of this into the, the background as a high key violet to play with. And I'll bring this over here. And I'm trying to find out where the background is showing through all of these details and everything, I think. That's a piece of hair. This is a piece of background. I think this is a piece of background. And this and this and possibly this are all little pieces of background. And so I'm, I'm doing the negative space first as I try to figure out what is hair and what is not hair in this composition. Okay, so I've got the background done. And I got myself two things of water so that I can do quick and complete rinses of my brush and pull all the pigment out of my brush before I do the next thing. So maybe I will do something like green because green isn't horrible. And I don't have a whole lot of choices here. So I could try the green. And what I'm gonna do though, is I'm going to do a tint of green. So I'm gonna pull some white and green together to give me a tint of green. And I might try to do something that's not exactly the same kind of tint of green as the Warhol one but we'll see how it works out. So we're gonna throw some green in here. And it's, oh, it's, it's that wonderful green that is just like the, um, just like that light green industrial institutional green that was in all the post offices. 
and hospitals in the 1960s. I grew up with it. I remember it well. All right. So I'm going to try to leave some space around the eyes and nose and mouth and details so that I don't obliterate them altogether, but that I can come on, come back in there later. And so we get this in her shoulders and we got that on the chin. And maybe I'll just bring a little dark green in here to kind of play with the idea of a little bit of shadow there and maybe a little shadow here. I'll catch a little shadow there, a little shadow on her chin and maybe just a tiny little bit of shadow underneath the eyebrow and kind of around the eye. We're gonna do a little bit of shadow because that kind of helps to catch things up there. Okay, give a little definition to the face. You can do the shadow by just using the full spectrum intensity color because being um, a little stronger, it's also a little darker. So what color for the hair? Um, in this uh, interpretation, um, Warhol went with kind of a yellow hair with a little bit of a brown, a reddish brown kind of a um, color in the hair. God, do I just want to do maybe I'll do orange hair because we've got violet, not that violet, just because, just because um, I'm desperate and I'm doing this in real time in front of you guys. I haven't planned this out in advance. And so I'm just gonna throw some color together to show you guys that your teacher is either a wonderful Superman or he's crazy. And we'll just, we're gonna see what happens with yellow, orange hair, orange hair, orange, you glad you came today. So I'm gonna throw some white into the orange to give me kind of a peach, kind of a tint of orange, and then try to do some of this hair. Um, now this, this kind of curls around and then this comes out from the back of the curl. It's a really interesting thing. Um, this is not the greatest paint in the world, but we'll see how this works. So I have to, I'm trying to look at about three things at once. I'm trying to look at the painting. I'm trying to look at the original. I'm trying to look at a Warhol's interpretation here to see how this works. I may want to come in with stronger orange next to the head. And this is all hair next to the head and the neck. We want to get um, perhaps a higher key orange. Actually, I really would like this to be yellow. I should probably just, I'm gonna drag some yellow into this right now and play a little bit. Throw some yellow on the other side of this puddle so that I've got yellow and white and orange all together, all to work with all at the same time. And I'm just gonna let it go. <clears throat> What's that song from Frozen that you guys love so much? Yes, we're just gonna let it go and follow some of that stuff out of here. Um, this is probably the scariest thing for people who've never painted before. The idea that, you know, you can just do some strokes and they can be, um, they don't have to be like completely well thought out and uh, perfectly executed or anything. We're just following some of the movement here. And let's see, this goes like this, and this kind of comes over the top like that and gets that going. And I'm just gonna play around with this a little bit and push one out like that and like that. And suddenly things are starting to happen here. Let's get a little highlight right there. And it's interesting that they don't have any highlights right next to the face right here and put all of the highlights, all of the highlights way out here in the edges but that's fine too. We can do that. In fact, I can just take white and just throw some white highlights out there because that's what we're gonna do. Okay, I'm gonna switch brushes because I'm gonna cheat. And I would like you guys to consider the idea of a really fine detail line making brush. Now, I don't know whether the little packet of brushes that you might've bought at Walmart at the beginning of all of this contained a small brush. This is a small round brush. I'm gonna throw it into water and try to pull it into a point so that you can see that you can make lines with a brush like this and it can become really fine. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm not even in the shot. So that you can make a point with this brush and it can make really fine lines and all of that stuff. But we will play a little bit with this now. And so 
Uh, what am I going to do this with? Well, since we started with violet, maybe I'll just use violet to make some of my um, contour lines. I think most of the details in the painting are kind of similar to contour lines. So we're going to try to do that with, um, let's see, the, the eyes have been totally kind of pixelated out because, of course, I went and took a very small um, 200 by 200 uh, pixel image and blew it up for this. So we have to kind of reconstruct uh, heavy lidded eyes that kind of are um, uh, almond shaped. And so we're going to get these lovely little eyes doing this kind of thing. We might as well just drop a little bit of a eyeball right into the middle of that, just like that. And so we're going to throw a little eyeball into the middle of the eye. And voila, we have some eyeballs looking at us. And we're going to bring a little bit of this um, down here and just try to, let's see, redo about the most famous um, bridge of a nose in um, art history for us all to look at. And there's just a teeny little bit of a nostril over here and a nostril that kind of is right here like this. Voila, and some lips. So you got these luscious, beautiful lips of Venus and it goes like this. And so we're just going to do this and it kind of comes up there into a little teeny tiny smile dimple right in the, in the edge of the lips like that. And so we've got Venus's lips, the lips of Venus, voila, and we just kind of going to go to do this reinforcement of this contour line and run it right down here, just like that. Okay, and then we can play, you know, you can have, you can come into the hair and you can do some of these kinds of movements in the hair and go up like this even with darker contour lines, because you can drag some of these um, contrasting uh, things into the hair, not just highlights, but also low lights can go into the hair. Now down here, um, she's got actually some kind of really, really thick hair that has these kind of bands that, that are kind of tying the hair together back here, which is really cool. I've always thought that that was just, um, just an awesome amount of hair you had such hair with such body that you actually had big you know thick kind of ribbons or bands kind of holding the hair together and so we're just going to do a couple of those to indicate that kind of thing in the background so what do we got okay also way over here in the upper corner of all of this move this move this over um there's this tree right here behind the um forest nymph and a couple of the leaves of the tree are kind of coming out here and so we've got a couple of these tree leaves that are kind of impinging on the hair from the side just a little bit. So as long as we get some tree stuff to deal with, let's just throw some, some green in here just for the sake of jazz. And we'll try to keep it sort of uh, leaf shaped, but it doesn't have to be. But anyway, you get the idea. I have to keep rinsing my brush out. So I'm kind of cleaning my brush and trying to think of how I'm going to paint all at the same time here. Um, this area has a little bit of a curl that comes up into the red and I've got the red background and then I've got the tree leaves here. And so I just need to do a little bit of that. Flip this up into here and bring a little bit of the violet uh background in around that flip and that pretty much gets everything the way it needs to be for the most part um your mileage may vary i'm just gonna open up that flip a little bit more this is another piece of hair so it needs to be just a little bit more of something like this right in here Okay, so let's see, she's got green, she's got a green face. So I'm gonna go in here with some, oh, you guys can't see that. I'm gonna come in here and grab just a little bit of the full spectrum intensity green and use that almost like an eyeshadow to give me a little bit stronger green on the top of these eyelids right here. 
and maybe help me define a little bit of the lower lid down here. We'll see how that works. And I can use the full spectrum intensity green to give me um, shadows. So I can do some of that kind of stuff. And there is actually a shadow on that part of that lip right there. And I guess there's a little bit of a shadow right there. There's also a bit of a shadow underneath the lower lip right here. There's a little bit of a cast shadow under that lip right there. And she's got a cleft in her chin, so a little bit of a shadow right there. And I, this is a big ass shadow over here. This is all kinds of shadow on this side of the face because there's less light there. So we see some, some shading and some shadow happening over there and just off the edge of the nose right there's a little bit of shadow. So I'm trying to observe you know, and take uh, some of these cues, these styling cues from the painting, translate it into my painting. What else have I got? I guess I could just play a little bit with a little bit more of these. Um, the idea of giving some directionality and movement and possibly, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, there's a, there's a highlight on the top of this strap. There's a highlight on the top of this strap. And oh, you guys can't even see that. Yes, you can, it's still in the shot. And a highlight on the top of that strap. There is perhaps a little bit of highlight here and a little bit of highlight there. Anyway, you're getting the idea that it is possible to um, build a, um, what is this? A subjective color, you know, composition. I'm gonna go crazy. I'm gonna give her orange, strange highlights in her eyes too, because I'm just that crazy. Okay, so this is almost like that's that, that uh, original Star Trek episode, um, The Cage. Um, we got one of those green ladies here. So I now have one of those crazy, strange green ladies from Star Trek going here. So we can make, we can kind of compare and contrast it to the Warhol one to see how well we've done. I want you guys to go a lot, if not slower, I'd like you to, to um, take more time to refine your painting so that it's not so slapdash. But in 10 or 15 minutes, I was able to rough this painting out and blast a whole bunch of colors in here to get, to get the basic um, uh, color um, structure of this painting. And like all paintings, or all compositions with color, it's really nice to look for the balances, the structural balances. So I've got you know, a violet background over here. It's kind of nice to have some violet over here to kind of help balance these things out. Um, I've got green in the composition. I threw a little bit more green over here to kind of unify some things so that we're not just isolated with green in only one part of the composition. Um, uh, we're using a lot of movement uh, things happening here with these um, with these linear elements. They are moving the viewer's eye through the composition. They add a sense of movement and a sense of flow, a sense of the wind blowing. And we're always trying to get implied movement wherever we can. Plus some of the violet that I'm using as the, um, uh, the color for my my low key value, which I'm kind of using as a, a contour line. Um, I'm picking that up from the violet in the background. So I'm using violet in the contour lines. I'm using violet contour lines for the low lights in the hair, as well as I'm using white and yellow and whatever as my highlights in the hair too. And then I can come back in and I can use, you know, yellow to some extent. I can do it while I'm talking to you. I can use yellow, you know, as a highlight and I can you know, put, pick up little highlights, different areas, different parts of the painting, you know, and the yellow then, the highlights can, the yellow highlights also help to unify the painting together better because just those tiny little yellow highlights in the face pick up on the yellow and the orange that's in the hair and really boom, bring that all together you know, I could even do that a little bit with just a little contour around some of the leaves out here. 
And, you know, like they say, boom, you know, I feel like Emerald right now doing a little bit of a boom, but that does tend to help to unify the composition when you use a little bit of that color in other areas of the composition. Oh, like out there, look at that. I just threw a little yellow highlight out there for no good reason. And it helps to unify the composition. That tiny little yellow highlight picks up on a lot of the stuff that's happening in that half of the painting. So I'm gonna move my paint out of the way. I've got this painting from this afternoon. I've got ah, this painting that's stuck to everything else over here from this morning. Ah, uh, so what a mess I have made. Is there enough space for us to look at these two together? So different color structures, um, green in the background, violet in the background. Um, orange to peach in the for the uh, facial features, green for the facial features. A lot uh, more uh, orange, red, uh, red orange in the hair and a lot more uh, yellow and yellow orange in the hair here. So two different interpretations of the birth of Venus, Botticelli's birth of Venus. Um, both of them done in a big damn hurry. Um, in about 10 minutes as demonstrations for the class, but this should give you an idea of, you know, an approach to subjective color um, for you guys. Not that I want you to be fantastic painters. I have to tell you that I'm not a fantastic painter. I did this as fast as I could because I wanted to paint more like a designer, picking up on some of the concepts of design, uh, in subjective color than worrying so much about it being a painting. Um, and that can be your escape clause too. That can be your justification. I'm not a painter. You know, I need, you know, I'm, I'm painting this in a design class. So I'm exploring the structure of paint and the idea of subjective color in this composition. I'm gonna come back, let's see, to my talking head version of me because uh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Um, in the morning, I did one other thing. I said, if anybody is taking this class and is part of the uh, digital design, um, digital design uh, program and has all of the Adobe suite of tools at your disposal, like Photoshop and Illustrator and whatnot, you could do this in Photoshop and Illustrator. In fact, I even leaned into the camera like this and I said, you could even do a painting of me. You could do a screen grab of me and then you could import it into Photoshop or Illustrator and you could paint me just like this as a um, subjective color interpretation of me. So somebody in the morning class actually took me up on that and, did, and wants to do a me portrait that is uh, done in, in a digital format. If you are taking digital design and have these capabilities, please feel free to do that. If you are not taking digital design, then we're gonna paint this as a, just a painting. So I've got a lot of these copied out on my uh, table outside of Eden Hall on the west side, the west side of the building. I've got the, the Venuses and the Wicked Witch of the West in addition to Madame Matisse and the Turning Road and Marilyn Monroe, you've got lots of choices, lots and lots of choices for doing this. I also recommend maybe that you go ahead and if you choose something to bring it back to paint, um, go ahead and use a Google image search to look up Botticelli's Venus, Birth of Venus, and look at the original one so that you've got that to go by. I've got a whole bunch of this stuff that I still have to upload into coursework so that you have uh, the actual um, assignment for this assignment. So I'm going to be working on that for the next hour or so, trying to upload this and create the assignment in coursework so that it's available to you. And I'm going to put a lot of this stuff that I've been talking about in coursework in this assignment so that you've got the instructions and you've got a lot of things to look at um, and uh, resources but that you can um, tag off from to then do more research if you need to and look at the originals uh, on a Google image search to see variations on a theme or whatever 
but then you get to um, actually do your own subjective color painting. I have to take like a breath. So nobody's um, asking me anything else in the chat and I don't see any um, microphones unmuted among my participants. I've been hard at this for about 40 minutes. And usually when I throw myself into a demonstration like this, as soon as I log off, I have to go take a nap for a while to try to uh, recharge my batteries because I put a lot into these kinds of um, things. I did not really train you guys as painters uh, to be doing all of these kind of painting things. And yet as designers, we are investigating color through painting. So I hope that you can take your limited palette of color and be able to look at this demonstration. And you know there will be recording of it so that you can look up the recording on YouTube and fast forward through all of the boring stuff to get to the actual painting that I'm doing to see if that helps at all help you guys paint this stuff. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you, you know, think about this stuff. Come on over and grab some of these sheets off my table here or just do some more thinkerizing on this because we've got next week also to do this painting. But this is going to be our last project in uh, basic design. It's going to be our last uh, project, this subjective color painting interpretation. And then we'll have a uh, final exam quiz during finals week, and that's going to do it for us. Uh, I am way behind on grading, so don't panic if you don't have a grade yet for some of your projects, because I will get to it probably this weekend. Um, so anyway, we've all got our work to count out for us. I hope you have a good weekend. I'll see you guys again on Monday, and we'll talk more subjective color on Monday. Wish me luck, and goodbye for now. So goodbye. <laughs>